to be to be called by the name of our Lord, to be part of his kingdom, indeed to have Christ in us, the hope of glory. There's nothing that can beat that and there's nothing that can there's nothing bigger than that that God has demonstrated his love for us in sending Christ to die for our sin. And this is the love that constrains us, the love that motivates us, the life that helps us to live our Christian life. As Paul Washer says, if Christ is not enough motivation for you to live for him, there is no motivation for you. So Christ is enough motivation for us to live for him and to do all things for, for his glory. So I want to bring God's word to us from the book of Ruth, chapter Chapter 3, we read the whole chapter, then we will dive to it. I'll ask you to open Book of Ruth, chapter chapter 3. The Lord has helped us to look at this narrative, the time that he allowed us to, and it is his story, it is his word that he has inspired for our encouragement, for our instruction, and even for our salvation. <clears throat> Book of Ruth, chapter 3. <clears throat> I hope I'm clear enough, because I have a cold got me yesterday. Yeah, so. But the Lord will help me and help us. I'll be reading from the ESV version. Ruth and Boaz at the threshing floor. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, shall Should I not seek rest for you, that it may be well with you? Is not Boaz our relative with whose young women you are? See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Wash therefore and anoint yourself and put on your cloak and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. But when he lies down, observe the place where he lies, then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. And she replied, all that you say I will do. So she went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had commanded her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap heap of grain. Then she came softly and uncovered his feet and lay down. At midnight, the man was startled and turned over and behold, a woman lay at his feet. He said, who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. And he said, may you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You have made this last kindness greater than the first in that you have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you I will do for you all that you ask, for all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. And now it is true that I am a redeemer, yet there is a redeemer nearer than I. Remain tonight, and in the morning, if you redeem you, good, let him do it. But if he is not willing to redeem you, then as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. Lie down until the morning. So she lay at his feet until the morning, but arose before one could recognize another. And he said, let it not be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. And he said, bring the garment you are wearing and hold it out. So she held it out and he measured out six measures of barley and put it on her. Then she went into the city. And when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, how did you fear my daughter? Then she told her all that the man had done for her, saying, These six measures of barley he gave to me. For he said to me, You must not go back empty-handed to your mother-in-law. She replied, Wait, my daughter, until you learn how the matter turns out. For the man will not rest, but will settle the matter today. That is the word of God. Blessed be his holy name. Oh, what a, what a story. It has been a great Narrative here, we have been learning, <clears throat> learning of God's divine providence for his people. To care for his people, to glorify himself, and this providence has been, have been bitter 
and sweet as you have seen. These stories up to chapter 4 covers a, a period of around 14 years, probably 14, 12 years. They were in the land of Moab for about a period of 10 years, then they came back at the beginning of barley harvest and wheat harvest, and so that's where we are now. It is during the time of judges, when everyone did what was right in their own eyes. So understanding that time will help you appreciate what God is doing in, through this narrative. The time of judges when there was no king and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. So in chapter 1 we saw a family leaving the land of bread, Bethlehem, the house of bread, and they went to Moab, a family of of four, you know, Elimelech and Naomi and their two sons. And when they went there, they married two Moabite daughters, Olpa and Ruth. So, and uh, this was in disobedience to God's law. And so there are consequences that follow. And death, poverty, and widowhood accompanies them. And so, at the end of chapter one, we see now Naomi returning back and she is bitter. She's not happy how she went full and now she has returned empty-handed. But she returns with, with a daughter, a Moabite daughter, who by God's grace and by God's providence is converted by their going there to the land of Moab. So, then in chapter 2 we saw how the Lord takes care of his people. His divine providential care for his people. How he'll take, he's taking care of these Less privileged people, there are two widows and one is a, is a foreigner, a poor orphan widow. So, and he does this through the, the laws that he has put in place of how they can be provided for, how they can be protected. And so the Lord is still very much with them. His providential care is with them. He is watching over them, he is guiding them. And this is possible because there are people who can obey God's law, where we are introduced to another character by the name Boaz, which means the Lord is great, a very rich man and a godly man who obeys the law of God and takes care so much of even Ruth, how he shows him, he shows her his kindness, even serving her, this Moabite woman. That was a big deal. And we saw that indeed Boaz is displaying to us a picture of Christ, even him coming and stooping low to serve us, we who are foreigners, we who are not God's people, and being brought in, being served by him. So that, that's how, and even chapter 2 ends uh, very unceremoniously, because even Naomi tells Ruth that Boaz is a potential bachelor. He is one of our redeemers. You know, he is one of our relatives, one of our redeemers. So that meant he is in a position even to marry her. Okay, but Ruth waits patiently, going there over and over and over and over, going to glean, going to, you know, to harvest, to correct the leftovers so that they can have bread at home. And we are told that in, in, in chapter 2, verse 23, so she kept cross the young women of Boaz, greening until the end of the barley and wheat harvest, and she lived with her mother-in-law. Maybe she never encountered Boaz again. Boaz was a rich man. He had many servants. Or perhaps there's nothing that happened. Now, here we are in chapter 3 now, where now Naomi wants to find rest for Ruth. She wants her to get married. She wants her to be taken care of because Barry and wheat harvest has come to an end. We are now into another season. And as we move to another season, we also introduce to, we want to move to another stage of life for Ruth. So here we are in this chapter where we will see love being expressed by these two people. And there is this great theme here of love that is displayed here and will show to us also the love of God, his loving kindness in how they behave, in how they interact with one another. Through their character, we get to learn even the bigger picture of the character and the nature of God, and especially his love for his people, his loving kindness for his people. That is the, the topic of our sermon today, his, God's loving kindness for his people. That his loving kindness has not forsaken his people. He is always with his people. And because of his love for them, it is because of God's love for his people that they get to get the good from God. 
We are in no way, we do not in any way qualify for the blessings of God. We do not in any way qualify for the goodness of God. It's only that God, he is good and he can love even the worst to transform them, to change them, to be his people and to be welcome at his table. So that's where we are. God's loving kindness is what we shall see here in how these two people interact with one another at the relation from. We look at it in these five points. There you have five points. If we, we had it the last Sunday on 24th, we could have had three points. So the longer I stayed with someone, I began to add to it. So we'll have five points. Number one, we'll see the purity of love. We'll see the purity of love and we'll also see, point number two, we'll see that love is patient. We'll see the, that love protects. Point number three. Point number four, you see that love rejoices in truth. Then you also see that love restores. That love restores. You see the purity of love, the patience of love, the protection of love, that love rejoices in truth and love restores. So, number one, the, the purity of love. Here we see the purity of love. Ruth chapter 3, verses 6 to 8 and verse 14. I'll be reading. So she went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had commanded her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. Then she came softly and uncovered his feet and lay down. At midnight, the man was startled and turned over, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. Then verse 14, so she lay at his feet until the morning, but arose before one could recognize another. And he said, let it not be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. So at the threshing floor, that's where Boaz was, and he is trying to separate the grain from the straw. At the threshing floor, that's where there is the, these Mediterranean weeds that are coming, and so that will help them to be able to separate the chaff from the, the wheat or from the grain, so that they can have it there well, you know. And so Boaz could spend the night there. Because you cannot leave your grain. It is during the time of judges. It might even be stolen. So you must guard your harvest. So Boaz was spending the night there. And he's the one who was at the threshing floor. We knowing Bali. So Naomi tells Ruth to anoint herself. And the image here is that she's telling us to prepare herself for this season. Or for this uh, stage that she's about to go to. Like anoint yourself. Prepare yourself for what is about to happen. You know, get ready for this. And so she gives her instruction on what to do. And so the other here doesn't give us any hint of sin happening in this interaction. It is a risky situation that could have easily led to sin, but no one causes the other to stumble. There is an expression of a pure love here for another, for both of them, between both of them. In a time when everyone did what was right in their eyes, these are people who with display to us a godly character. And their uh, pure love for one another that does not lead to sin, guarding one another from sin, it also shows us of their pure devotion to God. These are people who loved God purely. They were dedicated to God. When everyone, who, all the Israelites were holding towards other gods, you know, severally when God delivered them from their enemies, they still went back to serve other false gods. These are people who served God, the true God, purely, and it is displayed by how they deal with one another. Their character is of purity here. In Judges chapter 6 and, verse, and, and, and chapter 8, you see this, that even people wanted to destroy Gideon. They wanted to kill Gideon for destroying an altar of Baal. Even Gideon and the name Jerubal. Jerubal means let him contend with Baal. They wanted to destroy him. You see, people were, they really loved false gods. They were serving false gods. That's, that's, this is the season. This is the period of the judges. People loved false gods. They were devoted to false gods. They had an impure love for God. 
and pure love for idols. But these are people here who have pure love for God. And so their pure love for God is displayed to us here that indeed they deal with one another purely. There was rampant sexual sin during the time of Judges. Rampant sexual sin was happening. You know, and even Boaz here in, in verse 14 does not want even a hint of evil appearing. Let it not be known, verse 14, so let it not be known that even a woman came to the threshing floor. Though nothing happens, even Boaz himself doesn't want even any hint of any evil happening. And this is a command to us, even we saints, that we who are the people of God are to be pure before God. They are to deal purely even with one another and before God. That there is a command for us that in a generation that we are in right now, a generation that does what it is right in their own eyes. People who wake up in the morning and decide, today I'm not a woman, I don't identify as a woman anymore. People doing what is right, I can marry a man, I can, a woman can marry a woman. We are called to be pure. And we are called to display the light of the gospel, to be God, people of God who love God purely, and to demonstrate this by living purely and dealing purely with one another, to endeavor to see the purity of the bride of Christ. And we can see this in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 3 to 21. I'll read that, Ephesians 5. There shouldn't be even a hint of Sexual sin amongst God's people. We are to deal purely with one another. I will read Ephesians 5 verses 3 to 21. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as it is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, no foolish talk, no crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving, for you may be sure of this that Everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partakers with them, for at one time you are darkness, but now you are light in the world. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to design what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in unfruitful acts of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that, is, that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. But be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melodies to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father. In the name of the Lord Jesus, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ Jesus. This is how we ought to conduct ourselves during such time as this of evil, with purity, purity before God. And this demonstrates our pure love for God and even of our salvation from his wrath that is coming because of these sins that people are committing. So here we see a pure love displayed by these two people here. Is that our attitude? Is that your attitude before everyone who is maybe you know, before your brothers and sisters, before men and women who are not your spouse? Is that how you see them? Is your, is your language, you know, how you talk or how you dress, how you conduct yourself, is it pure before God? Are you dealing with one another purely? Even those who are looking forward to marriage, are you dealing with one another purely? Are you purely devoted to God that you want to treat the other one with pure love? Here is pure love displayed to us. And it's a love that only God can produce in us. We love because God first loved us. And love is a fruit of the Spirit of God. Therefore, those who belong to God must conduct themselves purely. Can we go to the second point? The patience of love. Love is patient. The patience of love. Verse 6 to 13 of Ruth chapter 3. 
So she went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had commanded her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. Then she came softly and uncovered his feet and lay down. At midnight the man was startled and turned over, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. He said, Who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. And he said, May you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You have made this last kindness greater than the first, in that you have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask, for all that my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy redeemer. And now it is true that I am a redeemer, yet there is a redeemer nearer than I. Remain tonight, and in the morning, if he will redeem you, good, let him do it. But if he will not, he is not willing to redeem you, then, as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. Lie down until the morning. So, uh, we see the patience of Ruth here. Since she came and was introduced to Boaz during the time of harvest, Ruth has been waiting. She hasn't made any move to Boaz or to ask Boaz for anything. She has been faithfully serving, providing and gleaning and going back home to Naomi. And even, even during this time that she is sent to the threshing floor, she patiently waits for Boaz to finish uh, winnowing Bali and even to sleep. I can imagine the picture of where she had hidden, waiting so that she can execute the instructions given to her by Naomi. And she's dis displaying to us the patience of love. She is patient to wait until the right time. And also even when uh, Boaz tells her, yes, I can, I am a redeemer, there is a redeemer nearer than I. Again, Ruth has to wait for the report. This is the man she wanted maybe to marry, but the word of God says there is a redeemer nearer than Boaz. And she has to wait until the right time when she comes home, she is told again by uh, my, uh, Naomi tells her, wait my daughter until you learn how the matter turns out for the man will not rest but will settle the matter today. We see patience, great patience displayed by Ruth here in waiting, in waiting for the right time and opportune time for the Lord maybe to answer her prayer. This potential redeemer and this is displaying to us even the patience of God towards the people of Israel during the time of judges. How they forsook God. God delivered them over and over yet they forsook him and went to other idols to serve other gods. But God was patient with them. He could have destroyed them. They, they, they had broken his law but Lord, the Lord was patient with these people. He waited on them. He did not destroy them. He was patient with them. And he went to raise judges again over and over to deliver them from their even from the enemies, those who had taken advantage of them. The Lord is patient with them. The Lord has not forsaken them. The Lord has been patient with his people. And even us, God has been patient with us. Before we came to salvation, the Lord waited on us. He did not destroy us. We have seen the Lord destroy non-believers. We were not better than them, but the Lord was patient with us to wait on us, to wait on us to even save us and redeem us from his wrath. God has demonstrated his great patience even towards us. And even when we came to salvation, we still are a sinful people. We do not live so right before God. We still sin, we still break his law and his command, yet the Lord continued to exercise his patience with us. He continued to preserve us because he is a patient God, and because he loves us. So yet the Lord does not deal with us according to our sin, how our sin deserves nor repairs according to our iniquities. He is a patient God. And so as Ruth waits here, we are also learning the character of God, of his love for us, how he has been patient, not only with the people during the time of judges, but even with us before we came to salvation, and even after, the Lord continues to Bear with us because he loves us. This was because of his loving kindness to us. Then another characteristic here of this love is that love protects. Protection of love. We see this in verse 9. Ruth is saying, 
he said, who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. Ruth is asking for protection. Ruth is asking for marriage, and that is how protection will come to her. That's how God will protect her, by helping her to be under a wing of her husband. And this picture is a picture of God, who is here displayed to us. And also, in chapter 2, that is what Boaz prayed for Ruth. Chapter 2, verse 12. The Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given to you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge, under whom you have come to be protected, under whom you have come to be taken care of. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty. So the Lord is preserving the people of Israel. He is pictured as preserving them, offering protection to them. And that is what Ruth is asking Boaz to do to her, to protect her, to marry her, and to offer the protection of her husband to this widow. And also, this is what, also what God did. He raised judges who defeated the enemies for them. God protected the people by raising judges who went and defeated their enemies. People, people ran away from their enemies. We see when the story of Gideon, when they are turning back because of their fear, because of the enemies. But the Lord is raising people to protect the people from their enemies. The Lord has been protecting them. And also even how the Lord has protected us from his wrath by spreading the wing of righteousness of his son to cover us from his wrath that we so deserve because of our sin. The Lord has protected us because of his love for us in clothing us in the righteousness of his son protecting us from his wrath that we, we deserve. The Lord continues also to preserve our soul. We could have become apostates. Many times we, we still act in unbelief. Yet the Lord continues to protect us from sin, from the world, from the devil. We are not much to Satan, but the Lord continues to protect us. It's because we have his wing of protection, because of his love for us, that he continues to protect us, that we continue to gather here to meet, you know, the, the church still continues to thrive, his truth continues to thrive because of his love, his protecting love for his people. So love protects, and we see God doing that exactly. He has protected us through the righteousness of his son from his wrath that he so deserve. What a God. Then the other point is, point number four is that love rejoices in truth. Love rejoices in truth. Love rejoices in truth. Verse 9 to 13. So Boaz asked her, he said, Who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. And he said, May you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You have made this last kindness greater than the first, in that you have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask for. For all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. And now it is true that I am a redeemer, yet there is a redeemer nearer than I. Remain tonight, and in the morning, if he will redeem you, good, let him do it. But if he is not willing to redeem you, then as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. Lie down until the morning. So Ruth here has identified a potential bachelor in Boaz. Ruth wants to marry Boaz. But Boaz tells her something else here that, yes, he is a redeemer, but there is a, a, a redeemer who is closer than him. There is one closer than Boaz. There is one who stands a chance, a better chance, we say, to marry Ruth than Boaz himself. And so Boaz is not following his feelings, or maybe he has feelings for Ruth, but he wants truth to triumph first. What the law of God requires of it, that we have to follow the law of God. That is what the law of God requires, and we have to follow that. I will not do what is right in my own eyes. Yes, you are a worthy woman. You are a woman whom I can marry and settle with, but that is what the law of God commands or demands of this reverent law to be exercised. So, Boaz rejoices in doing what is right before God, in doing and following the law and command of God. And that is what love does. Love does not give in to feelings or what you feel like or to emotions or to selfish interests. It follows and uh, rejoices in the truth of God 
in what God requires to be done. That is exactly what Boaz want to do. Not what is right in his own eyes, not because there is an opportunity, opportunity here. He could have done it and maybe gotten away with it, but not before God, whom he serves. And so if he loves God, he wants truth to triumph. And even Ruth here does not object it. Ruth does not object. Ruth does not say, no, this is, it is you that I want. No, Ruth is ready to do the will of God and to submit to the will of God. And she goes back home meekly and gives a report and she has to wait on how the matter is to be conducted even before the elders in the city. So this is, this is love rejoicing the truth of God in what God says, in what the law of God demands and commands of us. And I hope, is this our attitude? Do we ask ourselves, is that what the word of God says before we do it? Or do we say these opportunities because they sit well with us? Or because we have emergencies? Do we seek to consider whether we are obeying the law and the command of God? Because that's how we shall display our love for God in rejoicing the truth. Because in doing the will of God, you always be safe. It is a guardrail. The, God, the law of God is a guardrail for us, to protect us, to preserve us, to keep us in the path that are safe. And that is exactly what Ruth and Boaz are doing. They have love for each other, but there is what the law of God demands and commands, and they have to abide by that. There is a redeemer closer than Boaz, and Ruth has to wait. And they have to wait. If, if he's not willing, that's the only time I will marry you, Ruth. But if he is willing, you have to settle with that man. Because that's what the law of God demands and commands. And these are people who are delighting in it. Yeah. And I remember even a story by Alcis Pra that he used to give before he married his wife, the late Alcis Pra. And he said she was not a believer when he, he, when he knew her. And so before he could marry her, he prayed to God and asked God if Lord, you do not save her, then I will not marry her. Because your word, your word prohibits me from marrying an unbeliever. And so this is one who, and God saved her. God saved her by his grace and they married. So that must be our attitude. This is what the law demands of me. This is what the word of God expects of me to behave in such and such a situation. And therefore, I'm willing to serve the Lord and worship the Lord and honor the Lord because I delight in his truth that he has for us. Then we come to our last point. Love restores. The restoration of love. Uh, verse 16 and 17. See, when Ruth is on... And when she came back to her mother-in-law, she said, how, how did you fear my daughter? I can imagine the whole night Naomi was not, maybe she didn't rest, just waiting on how it will show her. Perhaps was Boaz there that day? Maybe he left? Or maybe Ruth was seen by other men? How did you fear? She's very much concerned. How do you fear my daughter? Then she told her all that the man had done for her, saying, these six measures of barley he gave to me. For he said to me, you must not go back empty-handed to your mother-in-law. Then she replied, wait, my daughter, until you learn how the matter turns out. For the man will not rest, but will settle the matter today. So this time, you not go back empty-handed to your mother-in-law. We have heard it again when they were coming back to the land of Bethlehem. That's how they came. Uh, verse 1, uh, chapter 1. Verse 21, it says, I went away full and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? The Lord had dealt bitterly with them, bitter providence that had emptied them. Naomi came back empty, but now the Lord is beginning to do something. The Lord is restoring. Is restoring Naomi and is restoring Ruth. It is, you will not go back to your mother empty-handed. You'll go with these six measures of barley he gave to her. It's like a down payment. It's like a physical evidence of the spiritual restoration that God is making even to Naomi and Ruth. No. <coughs> Sorry. This physical sign of grain is a sign of God's restoration. A son will be restored to her. Naomi lost a son. She lost her two sons. 
a son has been restored to her. Perhaps that day they will know the fate of, you know, either way, Naomi will end up with a son. A son will be restored because Ruth will be married again. We'll have a husband. And so Naomi is being restored by God. A son who is diligent and godly, who loves the law of God, who rejoices in the truth of God. Look at what the Lord is restoring here. You know, a son who is careful to obey the commands of God. We also see even Ruth will be restored. She lost her husband. She lost everything to follow God. She left land, family, inheritance. Is being restored by God again. To something much better than what she had lost in her land. She's gaining a godly husband. One who is diligent and one who is faithful to obey and keep the statutes of God. Ruth prioritized the spiritual over the physical. She prioritized the eternal over the temporal. She was lady. What led Ruth to leave the land of Moab was God. God and the people of God. That is what she was clinging to. This God who is the living God. This God who remembers his people. This God whose loving kindness does not forsake his people is the one she followed. She prioritized the eternal over the temporal. The kingdom of God. To be part of God's people. That was her concern. But the Lord is also taking care of the rest. The Lord is restoring her. And this is even a picture to us, even in the New Testament. Mark chapter 10, verses 23 to 31. That serving the Lord is not in vain. It is not in vain. It is not in vain in the life to come and even in this life. Sometimes. Mark. Verses 23 to 31. And Jesus looked around. The story of the rich young man previously when he said he, he will not lose his possession for the sake of following Christ. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his word. But Jesus said to them, again, children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and and said, with man it is impossible, but with God, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, see, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house, or brothers, or sisters, or mother, or father, or children, or lands, for my sake, and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses, now in this time, Houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecution and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last will be first. So there is a promise of God to restore what we have lost because there is a price to pay to follow the Lord. It will cost you everything, but you gain everything, especially brothers and sisters. Even maybe looking back at your life when you became a Christian, there are friends that you lost that you cannot keep in touch with them again because of the life that you're living, because now you don't want to do things that are right in your own eyes. You want to live according to the word of God and the commands of God. And now what have you gained? Brothers and sisters who love the Lord, who stir you to good, to love and to good works. And together with them, you will suffer greatly, but eternal life also awaits us. So that is what the Lord is doing here. Naomi is being restored. Ruth is also being restored. And God is restoring Far much better. That which was lost. That which was lost to follow God and his kingdom. The Lord is restoring. The Lord will restore land to Ruth. Probably she would have inherited a land. But in the land of false gods. She will inherit a, a land. With God's people. In the house of bread. And also even us the church. The Lord has restored us. Oh he has. The Lord has restored an elder to us. The Lord is restoring even members to this church. The seats will not be empty again. The Lord is restoring members to this church. He is preserving the name of this church. It will be retained. And even if that, is, that physical blessing is happening, we can trust God even for the spiritual blessing that God has restored us to himself. He has saved us. That which was lost, Christ has come to restore. That which is restored is far much better and glorious we have a restored relationship. We are waiting for a glorified heaven and earth. 
glorified people of God. We are being made a dwelling place for God because God has restored us to himself and through Christ, our Redeemer. Here we see a story of love, love for God. For us individually, helping us and even cooperating as a church, especially even restoring us to himself and brothers. That is the great thing that we have, that we have a restored relationship with God. You can be able to bear everything else. It doesn't matter who is against you. We now, the Lord is causing all things to work together for our good because we are restored to him, because we are his people. That every mistake that we do, anything that we do, anything that is happening to us, God is at work causing all things to work together for our good. The Spirit of God is praying in us that indeed we may be conformed to the image of Christ Jesus. That is the good that awaits us. That is the good that God has called us for. That is the, that's the restoration that we get to share in the image of Christ Jesus, the one in whom the Lord is fully pleased in. So we look beyond Boaz, we look beyond Ruth, we look to God, the restorer of his people, to God who works all things together for their good and for his glory. They are saying this is, this is the loving kindness of God. Not that we are good, but Lord in his mercy, Lord in his wisdom, he has chosen to restore us to himself. Lord in his goodness and kindness, he has chosen to protect us from his wrath to come by clothing us in the righteousness of his son. There is no greater love than this. Indeed, blessed be the name of our God. May we obey him. May we deal purely with one another. May we have a pure devotion to this great God who has done great things for us. Indeed, blessed be his name. Let us pray. Did our Lord, we thank you so much. Oh, what a love that you have for us, O oh God. That you have restored us to yourself, O oh Lord. And that you have promised to be with us, O oh Lord. That your loving kindness will never leave us nor forsake us. And even the time that we are learning here of judges, when everyone did what was right in their own eyes, there are people who are rejoicing in your truth, obeying your commands, O oh Lord. Lord, may we be those people, O oh God, who obey you and live in accordance to your will, O oh Lord. We are ready to do your word, O oh Father, and to live by it, O oh Father, that it is written, that we know what your will is and we'll be willing to obey it, O oh God. We'll be more than ready to do your will, O oh Father, and to live, O oh God, with great hope, O oh Father, and even with great assurance that we are restored to you, O Lord, and there is no more condemnation for us because of Christ, our Redeemer, O oh Lord. O oh, what a great love, O oh Father, a great love, O oh Father, that is displayed to us by you, Lord, through your Son. Lord, we bless you. Be with us the rest of the evening. And it is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. The Lord bless you.